Blast off. Woohoo. Good morning, everybody. Nobody's here yet, but they will be here. It's Natalie from Creative Makers. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me give you the report on my face because uh, they, they've been watching it. They watched it happen. Wait, is this on Facebook? <laughs> yes, this And not. you're giving a face report? Yes, a on face Facebook. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> a face report on Facebook. <laughs> exactly. All right, so here it is. This is the big damage right here, and it, it's looking really good. There's almost nothing over here. And my nose, the bandage is off. It's mostly straight. There's just a little bit of crookedness right there. I don't care, um, but I can breathe. <laughs> and this is all um, good for me. Hello, one person. I'm thinking, I'm gonna guess it might be Clifton. Anyway. <laughs> um, so today with me, I have Rick Wilson, uh, urban planner and artist and just everything. And so here we go. Ready? Ready. All right. First and only question. First and only question? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about what it was like being a kid and being creative. What did it look like for you? Um, start with creative play. So I had a Meccano set, which is, I'm from Canada. A Meccano set is like an erector set. Oh, I was going to say, what is a Meccano set? But okay, thank yeah. you for explaining. So it's got little pieces of sheet metal and bolts and stuff. So... I spent hours with that inventing things, making things. So that was, you know, sometimes people thought I should be an engineer because I'd invent things that way. So there was creative play, play with my train set, making imaginary places in, in, with my train set. But the art, art part was um, <clears throat> my mom was involved in the Windsor Art Gallery. I'm from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And they were in an old historic mansion, the gallery, and then there was a coach house. And the coach house was where the art classes were. Mm -hmm. And you'd, you'd sit on the stool with the thing. and With the thing, you mean the easel? Yeah, not an easel, you know, the stool that had the thing and you'd put a board. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. The thing. Yeah, yeah, the thing. The thing. The thing. Um, anyway, I remember vividly those art classes and I mostly remember the smell. Oil paint? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and thinner and everything, yeah. Just, yeah. I love that smell. So that was when I was younger and then nothing till uh, probably I was 35 and then I started pulling out the watercolors and still not much. And then um, we started in 2000, started a plein air painting group here in LA and that got me oil painting and so, so wait a minute so so you did not investigate art at all other than that that brief childhood period i mean it, it was sort of sitting in the background you didn't go to school for it you didn't nothing zero well i lied it's okay to lie in this program i i am afraid we're gonna have to cancel you <laughs> no i did when i was working as an urban planner in la in the late 80s, my job wasn't quite enough for me creatively, so I started painting again, and I actually was gonna quit my job and apply to MFA programs. Um, and then I got this wonderful gig as a professor at Cal Poly Pomona, so that went by the wayside. So yeah, there was one more um, so there was boiling a, uh, of the water. Um, so you thought about it. I mean, yeah. the fact that you even considered taking getting an MFA. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that that's that was the only other place to go for you, mm -hmm. I would think. So what you should know is that Rick is an urban planner. He he alluded to it right here, but we didn't talk about it. So er, by trade, he's an urban planner and he teaches at Cal Poly Pomona. You teach urban planning. Yeah, my specialty used to be transportation planning. Right, and, like uh, parking. The parking. Parking. You are the parking god. Now this is not this is gonna annoy your audience. I'm I want less parking, more bikes, more transit, more everything. So I'm trying to find ways that we can make our cities work without so much. I parking. love that idea. Okay. I, I wish it was safer. Yeah, well let's You know, that's the that's the problem. But well that's yeah. that's an aside. But I've kind of transitioned into I guess, ethics, how professionals make decisions, how to stay inspired when the world seems so messed up, how to decide when to compromise and when to not, because planning is completely embedded in politics. So, you know, planners face a lot of tough calls. And so my latest 
project is to help young planners with that. So let's go back to one of the points that you just said, which is interesting to me, how to stay inspired. What, so what's your advice on that? What do you tell kids? Well, my, <clears throat> I set up a dichotomy between idealism and realism. So I'm an idealist. I have a dream of what could be um, very strong within me. The world as it presents itself is not that excited about my dream of, you know, my favorite song is What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding. So Elvis Costello, one of my favorites Nick Lowe well. wrote it, though. Oh, did he? Mm -hmm. I didn't it's hear Nick that. Nick song. Ah. Anyway, so, so you have, the, most people who go into urban planning want to change the world, want to make it more just, more efficient, more sustainable. And so, but if you're just a, an extreme idealist, you're going to be crushed. Yeah, you don't get anywhere close. Yeah. Now, the realist, on the other hand, says, here's how the world works. Vladimir Putin, climate change, you know. Right. This is what we're dealing with. This is, yeah, here. So, so my thing is, both of those are two, you can't stick with either one. So my, my idea is that you navigate this territory between idealism and realism, that you kind of have to decide in the moment how to navigate this space, when to... When to hold out for your idealism, when to compromise and be a realist. And because I want people to not get discouraged, burned out, cynical, nihilistic, that kind of thing. So um, one metaphor is it's like um, urban planning is like paddling a canoe in a moving river. Mm -hmm. You don't control the current, but you do have a paddle, you know. So now I see na it's navigation in my mind. Well, I mean, I think this th this is sound advice for everything in life and especially for artists too yeah so i think idealism in art is, it's got i've never really thought about it before but definitely we make art because we have some dream of um you've got to get something out and you have some sort of idea yeah yeah and then the realism part is uh, when well some people encounter their limitations to represent reality you know and so then become discouraged, st stop making art. Um, so I think it's the same thing. It's different terms, but um, I've never thought about that before. Uh, but I think artists are driven by an ideal, whether it's reverence for nature or connection or beauty. And then also part of the realism is the art world, the market for art, all that stuff, right? Right. People crave... People crave a piece of somebody else's creativity next to them if it yeah. speaks to them. You know what I mean? That's what I think anyway. Yeah, but the artist also craves being seen and recognized. And if that's measured in art sales, then that could crush you too if the world's disinterested in your creation. Right. I think there's, I mean, I definitely know that in, in our group there's a, some people that struggle with that you know they de they really want they've got they're putting their art out there they really want people to take pay attention to them and so that they can maybe earn a living or earn some money from it and it's really hard because you have to you have to find an audience mm -hmm. and that's hard you have to find some like-minded individuals and also i think even if you're not seeking to making a li living from it there's just a level of vulnerability Yes. So every time I've had a show, I've had these moments before, like, oh, my gosh, what if this is crap, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah. What Here's if it's that. crap? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I just want to, oh, hey, Rosalind, I'm so glad you're here. I saw a couple people pop in and pop off. I don't know what's going on, but that's fine. Um, so, so okay, so you, you didn't get to art until later. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, actually start doing it on a somewhat regular basis and that was all because of the plein air group yeah because somebody was like let's every saturday we're going out and and you so you just kept showing up it was 19 new year's eve 1999 and kevin spitzy and i were at a party and i knew he painted a little bit he knew i did a little bit and mm -hmm. we said let's start a group so the next saturday i set off from my house on foot with my painting plenary easel and stuff and I walked by Ann Dudrow's house uh, and she saw me and so she and so the three of us started it and we grew to maybe 10 people and we painted once a week and for me plenary style for me um, I my life was pretty busy 
So having that on the schedule made it happen, right? Yeah. I, not, I was not painting much before that, and it's just like, this is what I'm doing Saturday afternoon. My whole family knew it. So it was really helpful to have the group. And we, we prospered. Um, we've, during COVID, we, people moved away. We stopped, but um, we've resurrected as an online Zoom group, doing a wider variety of works. So yeah, that's what, that's what did it for me. Yeah. Uh, right having having somebody wait for you to to show you you know somebody's waiting to see what you're doing well it definitely will get you into motion well i'm a, a much more simple person <laughs> it's just is it, is it on a schedule <laughs> that i'm doing it <laughs> well that's easy then all, yeah. all you need is a pen for that yep and you know leonard cohen said uh you know everybody wants to be an artist but you got to show up and do the work so yeah the showing up and do the work for me was every Saturday afternoon painting outside somewhere. And um, I don't think we ever really know the true motivations for things we do, but then we come to understand things as we're doing them. So for me, uh, being quiet in nature and having reverence for nature was apparent to me as I Something. was doing it. And we weren't completely quiet. Because all of us, from time to time, as many artists do, would sigh when we were frustrated. That's right. The and so sigh. we developed a ritual where you get fined if you sigh. So, like, yeah. <laughs> right, because when you, when you sigh, you you're in big trouble. Yeah, you're not supposed to sigh. No sighing. So, so you started with watercolor? No, I started in oil at, uh, with the plein air group. Well, Before I, that, it, I did watercolor. Yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you enjoy working in oil? Yeah. Now, I mean, oil is a messy medium, especially for plein air, because, I mean, yeah. you have to carry your work, you have to carry all the stuff with you, including the solvents, and then painting, you know, brushes have to be cleaned and all the rest of that stuff, and um, then carrying your work back, which is wet, you can't just put it in your pocket or something, Yeah. you know, that's sort of a big pain. Did you ever, I think you did mess around a little bit with acrylics, right? Sometimes I'd underpaint with acrylics, um, but no, I just started with oil. I mean, also fear of watercolor. Yeah, watercolor. It's too hard. Yeah, you know what? Some people love watercolor. I, I don't get it, but that's okay. No, I love it. It's just, oh, it requires it. a level of pre-planning and draftsmanship that I didn't think of that I had. Yeah, I'm in agreement. I'm definitely fly by the seat of your pants sort yeah. of girl. So That's with oil, I just that. accepted, the, the major problem for me was not carrying it around or whatever, but um, that if you painted over wet paint, you'd make a muddy mess. Um, and one member of our group, Chris Zambone, could magically do this with a very light touch. Yeah. It was amazing. Uh, but I just accepted that as part of the game and, and didn't always, didn't generally try and do it in one shot. I let it dry and, and reconsider parts of it the next week. Yeah, that's hard though in plein air, you know, starting a painting and then walking away from the place that you're painting it, mm -hmm. especially with changing light and everything else, yeah. you know, and then getting back to it. I always had a hard time with that. Yeah, and I guess one question about your purity as a plein air painter is are you going to take a reference photo? Right. And I usually did. Yeah. You know, because um, it depends what, what you're trying to do, but. At that point, I was trying to do something that was quite representational, so um, I needed that because, as you said, conditions change so quickly. Yeah. Now, you have some pieces here. Were these pieces that were plein air? Yeah, these are the old Rick. The um, old Rick, as yeah. opposed to the new Rick. Um, so here. this is up... I'll hold. Okay. <coughs> you up, discuss. That's up at Morro Bay, um, where another member of the group invited us up and we went there for a painting weekend. Those are the smokestacks they're about to, to tear down. Um, part of my interest as a painter, maybe as an urban planner, is the interface between natural and human-made things. So painting smokestacks kind of appeals to me in the yeah, context of nature. A little closer. And um, I think that's, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, across from Detroit, Michigan, and kind of a lot of decaying industrial infrastructure in Detroit and Windsor, and I found beauty in it. So a lot of my plein air works are looking at the interface of, of natural and human systems. And, you know, more broadly, um, 
issues of sustain sustainability and how um, how we interact with nature. Now, um, question: Was this done all in one sitting? No. Okay. So not done in one sitting. No, definitely not. It's too pretty for that. <laughs> uh, was it so, two sittings? Three sittings? Well, it was. It's it was, really. You know what? It's. I really like it. It's so it was great. done. It, you know, three hours in the field, and then I did take a reference photo and I messed with it when I got home. Now. You, I don't know if I'll be sued by the Plein Air Painters Association of America. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to. Don't you know? No, I'm gonna don't defend. File a I'm gonna defend your case. Should should you? <laughs> Maybe your viewers will will file. A, a, a I'm gonna complaint. defend your case. Should the Plein Air Police come after you? Okay. Now, um, you you talked about this being the old Rick. Yeah. Now, do you have, you have more old Rick back here? Just one more. Yeah. Let's pull out some more old Rick, and then we'll talk about new Rick. So this is. This is a local place to where we live. I so I think that. you had Roderick Smith on your program before? He, yes, Roderick Smith's been on my program. <laughs> so this is the archway leading up to his house. So yeah. this is from Sycamore Park in, in the Highland Park, uh, looking across. And um, closer. I always liked it because I was able to get a little more graphic, uh, a little bit more simplification in the trees than I usually achieve. So, um, But these paintings I, I have hanging in my house they're quiet, they're nice to live with, they're not, I'd say, attention grabbing. Mm -hmm. And so that's a quality of art also that when you think about how your pieces show in a gallery, some grab the eye and others are quieter and sometimes the quieter ones are, are, are better to live with. Or the, or the uh, attention grabbing ones are doing it with something that wears out. Over time, there's lots of work that I've seen that that I think is meaningful and expressive, and even maybe beautiful, but that I don't want to be around 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't necessarily want to sit with something that makes my heart want to um, beat out of its chest because of the excitement of it, whether mm -hmm. it's the subject matter or the color scheme or whatever. So I, th I think that's a really valid point, having something that, that you like looking at and that means something to you and that is peaceful in a way. I think that's a really, you know, I think that's underrated. Mm -hmm. Another way to say that is, I mean, uh, uh, maybe artists are in a search for truth and who knows what truth is, but if there's something true in the work, it lasts expresses itself mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of the way I look at it. there's there's something true about that to me and only me but um, that's why I like having it in my house so this is oil and this was a plein air piece again did you do this all at once nope nope <laughs> um, started it in the, in the field maybe two times in the field I think we as a group we'd go to a place for a month so you would have the chance to go back and as Natalie said conditions change but you get another shot at it and I, and I probably mess with it after that too yeah it's it's really beautiful it's it's really beautiful representation of what I know as this place yeah you know yeah completely recognizable just really lovely okay so this was old Rick yeah let's talk about new Rick or newer Rick what's going on with new Rick ah uh, crisis crisis <laughs> yes. midlife no, I'm too old for that. That's <laughs> how gone. No, I don't know. I mean, I COVID was was hard. Yeah, the two the two years undercover, and emotionally. yeah. Um, and it's funny we were so dense. Painting outside was one of the safe things to do during COVID, but it just seems like everything stopped. So, yeah. I stopped opening up my oil paints, and I discovered a reluctance to paint. I think that would be resistance. Okay. <laughs> Same um, difference. Uh, whatever it was, um, I don't know, I, in my mind it was partly time, but something else is going on. So, what I found less resistance or reluctance to was drawing um, with charcoal on paper. I found it to be fast, not a big time commitment, and it just grabbed me. So for the last year, I've been doing works on paper. Um, 
and some of the plein air painting group thinks Rick's got to get back to that. Something wrong with them. Oh, is, but, it, is that the prevailing well, opinion? Not prevailing, but there's a few. Uh, group I haven't. I haven't been in the the Zoom monthly meetups for the last probably six months just yeah. because my schedule has not allowed, which I sort of I miss. I'm going to try and be there next week, but great. Yeah. yeah. But in any case, whatever. So anyway, I've. Um, I've enjoyed it, and these are some of the pieces I've done. Hey, do you want to pull pull one down that you especially love, and let's talk about it. Well, okay. Yeah, pull it because that way I can bring let's it up closer. Um, I don't know. Th I like one. them all. So I like that one too. This one. This is an all. No. Okay. All right. I got it. You you go. Sorry about that light. So yeah. this is um, up at Mammoth. I was with my pals. And, um, That's better. you know, when you're with a group that doesn't paint, it's really hard to grab the time to go paint. Right, because nobody wants to sit with you or have the patience to wait for you to finish your thing. And it somehow seems selfish, like you've made a judgment on the, on the group. So um, I went out and I did this probably in an hour and a half. That's pretty and good. And this is... This is a big piece, too. This is what, like 18 by 24 at least? Yeah. And this is, so it's a real plein air. That's, uh, maybe I smoothed some things over when I got home, but it's mostly what I did in the field. Uh -huh. So in that respect, it's exciting to me, and it has a certain vibrance because it's got original gestures. Um, what I like about this size is that um, I'm using my arm, not just my hand. It's so different than doing a precise little drawing. Uh, so I like that. And then what I noticed is... Once I get going, my hand um, takes on a life of its own. Right, it's it kind just of, does its thing, kind of right? spastic, and it creates excitement that never would have been there had it not taken on a life of its own. So, um, uh, just like the plein air painting, this one is pretty much what it was. Um, this this one, which is. And Ludrow's house. I spent a lot of time. Sorry, out guys. We're just getting another painting. I have to get out of the way. Otherwise, I'm going to get smacked. All right. Don't want another broken nose. No, no more broken noses. Here, I'm going to um, back it up so that you can see the whole thing. This is our friend Ann Dudrow's house and, um, in Mount Washington. And this one I did do a lot of work after. And for those of you that do charcoal, you, you may know that you can get away with erasing once or twice, and then the paper gives up and can't handle it anymore. So I ran into that doing this. But um, this one, you know, is a, a, a on site and then using a reference photograph inside. Now, um, you were talking about gestures and about how your hand takes on its own uh, life as you're as you're working in triple. Did you find that to be true also in painting? No. No, you didn't have that thing where your hand just did its own thing? I was being too careful. Ah. Uh, yeah. Working smaller. Yeah. Right? And, yeah, being too careful. See, the, the risk of messing up mm -hmm. with this medium is so low. You just turn the page and do another one, right? But that's the same thing with paint. I mean, you just paint mm -hmm. over it. You just lift it right mm -hmm. off and just do your thing, especially I, with oils. Somehow I didn't feel that way. Oh, See, I've got Scottish roots in me, so I'm a cheapskate. I don't like to waste anything, even paint. Trust me, you're in the right group for this. Everybody talks about... The, did you know that there's there's artists that do pores? Do you know what pores are? No. Pores are like when they put a bunch of different colored paints in a cup, and then they flip it onto a canvas, mm -hmm. and then it, it just... they use a particular medium with it and it just sort of explodes and there's what they call cells of color and, mm -hmm. and they just sort of open up everywhere without you even having to do anything and they slide the paint around people will collect the paint that's ended up on the plastic and, re and reuse it of for course stuff. yeah of yeah. course <laughs> so i felt a little guilty about that while i was a plein air painter but it's just who i am I, that's just how i am so that's the truth of me I don't like to it's waste It's okay. It. Well, yeah. I, I will forgive yeah, you. Yeah. So um, painting in oil seemed like more high stakes. You, you had pressure to make it work. Hmm. And this seems free. Also, as you get older, my, my parents are, are dead, and they collected art, and I have had to deal with figuring out what to do with the art. Yeah. Very stressful because 
I don't have any room. It's beautiful. I don't know what is important, what's not important. So I'm very conscious of what my children will have to deal with when we're gone. Yeah. So this takes up no space. Yeah. Stretch canvases, you know. Right. That's, that's they, a lot they do of take stuff. up space. So these you can just take out of the frame and just sort of stack up on top of each other. Yeah, you put in a little. In between. Uh, yeah. So I, I lo that to me that's given that I'm a cheapskate. That's a sense of freedom, yeah. you know, nothing wasted, no big deal. You're, you're conducting an experiment rather than producing a beautiful piece of art. Yeah. Um, I know that you, are, are, do you pursue, like, shows and selling stuff? I mean, because I don't, I don't see you in that realm very often, but maybe you're doing stuff that I don't know about. Not really. No? The only place I have work right now is Bird Dog Art, which is this crazy... Um, it's still sitting up there? Large still art. There? Yeah, I actually sold some pieces there. Congratulations. It's in an outlet mall in Tejon over the five. We yeah, there's there's a freeway that sort of goes through the state of California from uh, south to north, and it goes up over the mountains, like from L.A. on your way to, let's say, San Francisco. It's got the world's busiest Starbucks, because that's where everyone stops Yeah, Yeah, because it's a big stop after like a long place yeah. with nothing. So it's a... Re it's ridiculous on the surface. Here, in the middle of crass consumerism, people trying to get a better deal, is this very large art space. But it's been going for a year. Yeah. And the idea is a lot of people are at this outlet mall against their will, right? Somebody in the car wants to stop. So oh. I think it's, it's subversive. It's putting art in a place you wouldn't expect it. And then people are like, well, since I'm here, I might as well wander in. Yeah, and yeah. Why not? And then... Pretty soon their wallet's open yeah, yeah. and they find something that they love. Yeah. But other than that, you know, I don't, I don't try, I don't, I'm not trying to actively sell my art right now. Um, I know that you were playing with like abstracts for a little while, a very short period of time, I would say. Yeah. Unless, that was my COVID, well, pre-COVID. You did it before COVID. Yeah, you're right. Even you're right. While we were painting plein air, you were yeah. you were starting to do abstracts plein air. Yeah, I did a show. Uh, I did a series on the Four Street Viaduct in L.A., and I had a show at Cal Poly with mm -hmm. Rod Rick Smith on that. Right. And um, the geometric quality of the bridge and the L.A. River, I think, led me in that direction. So. What I found is if I studied something a long time and did a representational painting of it, mm -hmm. that prepared me to simplify and do an abstraction. I, I, I've never been able to just start with mm -hmm. an abstraction. But yeah, you're right. That, that, that got me doing it. And um, it was fun. Uh, but, but not your it call. It's not my thing right now. While you were doing the abstractions, uh, I mean... Do you think that working representationally, just you got to know your piece so thoroughly that you became, you got to be redactive in what you wanted to take out? Yes, that's how yeah, it is. Yeah, so you be, became aware of the, the geometry of the thing and interesting things related to that geometry. And yeah, I think definitely. So if someone wants to try abstraction, I, I suggest do a, do a representational piece and then and see where and you then, can go. And then try to take the things out. And simplifying and yeah. What, try to decide what's important. Mm -hmm. And then, see, the problem with plein air painting is the complexity of everything. It's a three dimensional space, so there's a, the representation as a drawing, and then there's color. So, part of this thing is I have a resistance to color. I think it's interesting. We are overexposed to color. If you watch television, you're the hurting. Ads. You're breaking my heart right now. Overexposed to color. Yeah, what yeah. the? Well, sorry. I might. I might have to stop this video right yeah, now. Nobody <laughs> said you weren't going to get your heart broken in this series. <laughs> so if you watch television commercials, yeah, they are blasting us with beautiful colors, but yeah. it's like an overdose of color. This is a very interesting theory. That something that I have never thought about before about too much color. Well, let me just tell you what I've learned on this journey without color. And, and then the way I look at the landscape. Sometimes color is essential to the truth of the, 
the, of what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes color makes the image compelling and sometimes it doesn't. And I think it's a distraction hmm. from, you know, obviously form and value, right? Mm -hmm. So this series, I, I just, part of the reason I am not opening up the, the oil painting tubes, I think is this, is this, I just want to stay away from color for a while. Interesting. Well, what if you only worked in two colors? Let's say like yeah. sepia and black. Two is more than one. <laughs> no. Aye, aye. Yeah. I, so who knows where I will get? I'm looking out the door here. I'm seeing beautiful color. Yeah. Um, but this is more avoiding. This is more the, I don't know. Do we dream in color? I don't even, I was trying to remember that today. Yes, I do. Okay. Do you? I, I don't know. Mm. can't remember but to me this is more out of the unconscious and what I'm trying to do is give my unconscious voice it's more primitive mm -hmm. it's you could pick up a burned stick and draw on a rock it, right. there's something elemental about it that just appeals to me where I'm at right now and the idea of letting my unconscious speak rather than my intellectual mind that wants to produce a nice colorful image that's part of this. So I don't know where it's going to go. I'm sure I'll go back to color someday. And I have done chalk pastels. Right, which involves color. But the color isn't as, it's, I mean, for the most part. It's kind of subservient to the form a bit. Yeah. 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 I mean, and even when they're vibrant, you still, it's not the same. Yep. It can be diluted so mm -hmm. easily mm -hmm. if, just by touching it. You know? Yeah, because one of the, when I work in color, one of the most interesting ways to do it is like the classic <clears throat> oil painters used to do is do it with value and then you're adding some color over top mm -hmm. rather than starting with color. Because right? mm. pastel, it, the colors of pastels are just weird. Yeah. I have a big set, but still I never see the color I want. Yeah. So when I do in color, I'm getting into a, Kind of a crisis. So in the middle of it, I'm in crisis thinking, what a mess. And then somehow you find you work your way out of it. But I think that's true. I don't know about you, but I know for all my work, when I get those first few layers down, I'm like, oh, how is this ever going to come yeah. together? Yeah. That's <laughs> you know? true. Yeah. You know, and then little by little, you're like, oh, here it is. And then by the end, I'm like, oh, I like doing these finishing touches, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's over. And then I can't remember how I started it. Yeah, so I photographed you um, and Dave collaborating with Rod Smith on a giant piece, right, mm -hmm. on paper. Mm -hmm. And I did one myself. Oh, right, right, right. And and what he's referencing is um, our friend Rod Smith, ha <laughs> he's, he's a super creative guy. He has these giant pieces of paper. They're, what, like six feet by four feet or something yeah. like that. And he invited all these individual artists one night at a time to collaborate with him on this work. And, um, and so Dave and I had our night with him, and so did you and a number of other people in the area that, that uh, he knows. And that was really fun. That was really interesting. Yeah, so as an academic, I, because I saw, I don't know, six or, so, or six people did it maybe? Yeah. And I observed you and Dave. Uh, Right, because you were there. And he was were, our photographer that you night. You were completely different in approach from me and Rod. So um, it's almost like his process reveals how different artists think, right? Yes. So you were very bold and assertive. Yes. Rod had to get his elbows out to get in there sometime, push you aside. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he's in my way. And you were color forward. He was in my way for sure. <laughs> he got in your way, right? <laughs> yes, I um, am color forward. And he, I remember him remarking to me, he's like, you use color the earliest. And yeah. I, I was like, what? How is that? <laughs> well, how, what do you mean? What's wrong how with could, those other people? Yeah, exactly. How could you not use color first? <laughs> I don't understand. So I find that fascinating. Like, normally you think it of is art making as learn from the teacher but what if art making is teacher learns from the artist about how how differently we all start out right absolutely yeah i always uh there's always a saying that i've always got in my head teach art art teaches yeah you know exactly. yeah 
totally. Okay, I see that there's some um, some things back here. So, okay, Ro is watching. Hi, Ro. Clifton, who I, <laughs> I knew would be here. I understand about gestures, so he's just agreeing with you here. And I like his so-called black and white work. So he just, he's lending that to you. Great. Um, yeah. So do you have an idea of where you want to go next, or is this just it for now? Well, this is part of a larger project. So oh. I, I write poetry. Yes. And I've never published it. Oh. So I want to do a poetry book called Living on the Side of the Mountain, mm -hmm. and I want to alternate poems with these. Mm -hmm. So I need a lot of drawings to match the number of poems I've written. How many poems have you written? Oh, they wouldn't all go in the book, but probably 150. Wow, okay. So, so that's the larger project of, of, of uh, and, and the larger, larger project is Doing this work, writing poems, to me is a kind of prayer. It's a kind of expression of reverence for something larger than me. And I know some of your audience may be agnostic, some religious, but... Um, I think we all feel feel like art is our spirit. Okay, yeah. so then <clears throat> that um, observation or truth is more and more prominent in how I'm thinking about using the time I have left to make art and what its purpose is. So, plein air taught me a bit about this because it taught me being quiet and observing in place for hours and hours where the world speaks back to you. It's not a one-way extraction of image. Um, right. So, I got that from plein air painting and I think it's coming internally for me. So, um, that's what that's what will drive whatever I do in the future. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, is the sense of mystery of, um, you know, I know I'm not completely in charge of the enterprise. Right, right. There's I always wanna, somebody else is driving the big boat. <laughs> yeah. And so I want to be, again, Leonard Cohen's one of my heroes. He said, you know, you got to got to show up and do the work. So I want to be present with my charcoal or paint in hand when inspiration from a bigger place comes to me and I want to be a conduit for it, but I feel like when I do something I really like, I do not claim it as just mine that I did it. Uh, so, and that's, maybe that's the ultimate motivation. It's one, I mean, you can go to church, you can do good in the community. There's a lot of ways you can connect to something larger than yourself, mm -hmm. but I think art is one. Yeah. Um, and it's very direct and makes you vibrate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vibrate. I love that word. Yeah. Um, how soon do you, how, how long do you think it's going to take you to get your book put together? I mean, is it this point, is it just waiting for drawings? Yeah. And yes. Yeah. So, Cause all the poems are done. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're not done, but I need, they're written. <laughs> how, how many do you think that you're going to put in the book? I mean, would you, 50? Yeah, maybe 50. Yeah. So, um, I just got to carve the time out for it, like I'm sure everybody that's watching. I would even say to you to possibly make it smaller than 50. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, poetry is hard to take in sometimes. And it's dense. Yeah. It's dense. And I feel like even having 50. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. Um, and it's a lot to think about, but if you make it in smaller volumes, so to speak, you know, volume yeah. one, volume two, or, you know. Yeah. No, that's a good idea. I don't know. Something to think about. But definitely, um, you have to respond to a poem. You just don't read it. Right. Right. So, right. I have this compilation of Robert Bly's poems, and so it's a huge number, and I just slowly went through it, and my way of responding was to write a poem of my own on the page. In response, or yeah. in, in yeah. regard and to And I learned a lot about his phrasing and other things by trying to do that. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely not, poetry is not, you don't sit down and read a book of poetry. 
like in our life, um, we're Jewish and we celebrate Jewish holidays and we just had Sukkot, which is this uh, festival, harvest, harvest festival. So we read like one or two or three poems, our favorite poems. So that's how poetry works in life, in your life, in, your, in, your, in the way you live your life rather than you sit down and read a bunch of poetry. Yeah, it, you know what, this is a whole new idea for me because I am not one, I like to hear information and then I like to hang on to it, you know what I mean? And poetry isn't like that. Yeah. You don't just read it once, you can't, there's, remembering stuff is difficult for me, so um, reading like an esoteric idea that might come through in a poem in not as straightforward a way as you would like just having a little story that has like some sort of through line, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It is, it's a whole new idea. Like it needs to be read more than once and sat with mm -hmm. and, and, and contemplated. And a small number of poems may become a central part of your life and your practice. Mm -hmm. So one, I can't remember who said this, but somebody said, um, a poem is something that the individual needs to say, but can't say normally like it's it's a it's an upwelling from the unconscious that needs to be expressed but cannot be expressed in conventional language so it's got all this if it's coming from the soul or the unconscious it's got all this mystery in it mm -hmm. you know so it's to me it's creating a, it's like meditation it's creating a space through an experience of reading that allows you to open up realize you know it it's a process of it's a process and i think Visual art, too, right? Right, you yeah, know, same absolutely. Thing. You stand in front of a painting you love, and you get to know it, and it evokes something for you. Right, right. It's, so, it's just so funny what we're all attracted to. Like, I'm much more attracted visually mm -hmm. than I am, let's say, word-wise. You know, words for yeah. me don't, don't hit home the way visuals mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. You know, in visual, I can look at something over and over and over again. Words... I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to. But maybe both of them. One way to look at it is it's a means to an end. Yes. Right? The yes. end is self-realization or transformation and looking at painting, reading a poem, music, yeah. having a good conversation. These are all transformative. And that's yeah. what, kind of what we're seeking. You know what I'm, I, I'm just thinking about right now? I'm just thinking about how Rod-like you are in this moment in time. Well, I think we get along. We have a different style, but yeah, definitely. I... <laughs> Definitely. You know, that that uh, meandering, thought-provoking manner uh -huh. is here. Yeah, it's about, yeah, o about openings, not... Just everything, yeah. just about everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. It's good. Yeah. It's good, because I know that's something that you really love. Yeah, we, I mean, he, he he's, we have great conversations. I have to, like, insert myself occasionally. Yes. Uh, and he doesn't mind. So Th that's agree. good too. Yeah. yeah, but this is not about Rod. Um, here, I promised that. Oh, okay. I promise. I promised Rick that I wouldn't keep him too long because he's got some place he has to be. But here, let's uh, let's see what else there is to say, and then we will close it up for you so that you can do your thing. So uh, Clifton is asking. I like this gentleman. Very contemplative. He's a seeker and a searcher. Poetry is painting in the mind. So these are just. Oh, that's a great uh, way of saying that. Yeah. yeah. This is Clifton or, or, relaying this information. Or painting is poetry on the canvas. Painting both is, ways. Yes, yeah. both ways. Both ways. All right. Well, I don't want to keep you, but I do appreciate you talking to me. Thank you. It's so, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got lots of things to think about, me even too, though they're words too. and stuff. Yeah. I appreciate it. Okay, Natalie. I, okay, Rick. All right, you guys. We're calling it early. Have a good Sunday, and I will see you next week. Bye.